Well, I would like to begin this evening by talking about regulation. Almost every week, not every week, but quite frequently on this show, someone mentions that it's certainly true that we have to be very, very wary about big government, but we also need to be wary about big business, that big business can control us, big business can cause problems, big business can monopolize our lives, big business can make us do whatever we want. And therefore, we do need some government regulation to keep big business in check. I don't happen to believe that. I don't believe any government regulation is necessary. I believe, in fact, that all government regulation is dangerous. Not just dangerous, but downright harmful. That government regulation reduces our standard of living. Now, suppose there were no regulation whatsoever. Would that mean that you would be willing to get on an airplane and fly if you thought the pilot was drunk? Would that mean that you would be willing to deal with a doctor and put your care in the hands of a doctor that you weren't satisfied, knew what he was talking about? Well, the first question that arises is, how can you know these things? How do you know whether the pilot is sober? Well, if there is any number of incidents in which pilots or doctors or other people create problems, then you're going to hear about it. And if you're going to hear about it, then you're going to be very wary of these things, and you are not going to take a chance, uh, if you're like most people, you're not going to take a chance unless somebody can prove to you, to your satisfaction, that you have nothing to worry about, that an airline can guarantee that its pilots are sober, that doctors can guarantee that they know what they're talking about. How would they do that? I'm not really sure. It doesn't matter because... If they were free to do so, if government hadn't monopolized this field of regulation, then there would be all kinds of people coming up with ways of doing this, and they would be competing with each other to provide the lowest cost, most efficient way of providing that kind of regulation. But we need to recognize that first and foremost, the most important kind of regulation that exists is what I call personal regulation. That means your ability to simply say no, to not buy something if you're not satisfied that it will do what you want at a cost you're willing to pay. You didn't have to buy the new Coke when Coca-Cola decided to come out with a new kind of Coca-Cola back in the 80s. And enough people didn't buy it that Coca-Cola abandoned the whole project. You didn't have to buy an Edsel in the late 1950s when the Ford Motor Company decided to thrust this on the American people. You didn't have to buy anything. You only have to buy food, and you have all kinds of choices available to you, and if you weren't satisfied with any of them, you could grow vegetables in your backyard if you had to. You would find a way to take care of it. So personal regulation is your final and irrevocable opportunity to regulate industry. There's a second kind of regulation. I call it industry regulation, although I hate to use that term because it sounds like some kind of industry association getting together and policing its members, and that's not what I'm talking about at all. That's of no value to you whatsoever, and too often it leads to government control. The doctors all get together, form a medical association, and get the government to declare that nobody can be a doctor and practice medicine unless he's a member of that association and approved by that association. Same thing with the lawyers, and it happens in several other fields as well. Now, what I mean by industry regulation is that if somebody is not treating its customers correctly, somebody else in the industry will take advantage of this and offer whatever it is the offending company is failing to offer. If somebody's charging too much, then somebody else will come in and say, hey, I can provide this for less. If someone is not providing a user friendly products, someone else will come in and say, hey, I know how to make this available to you so that you can use it much more easily. If someone else is not providing a safe product, somebody else is going to come in and say, I can guarantee the safety of this product, and here's how I'm going to do it. So industry regulation really is what we think of as competition. Whatever it is that you're afraid of, whatever it is you think might be something terrible that would happen without the government to watch over you, is simply an opportunity for somebody to make a profit by coming along and satisfying your needs. All right, the third kind of regulation that's available is what I call consumer regulation. Consumer regulation is just other consumers doing things that benefit you. They make a demand for a certain kind of product or a certain kind of safety or a certain kind of service. And because of their demands, you get opportunities and alternatives that wouldn't exist otherwise. Consumer regulation is uh, sort of like a free gift from your neighbors. You might not have a clear understanding of what makes a particular kind of product safe or unsafe, effective or ineffective, uh, reliable or unreliable. But many other consumers do, and their decisions to buy or not to buy will push sellers to provide better products for everybody, including you. One advantage of personal and consumer regulation is that you and others don't have to agree among yourselves on which products suit you best, how much safety you're willing to pay for, uh, what risks you're willing to take, or what risks you'll avoid at all costs. The variety of suppliers available allow you to buy the product that you want, that suits you best, while someone else can buy a product from a different supplier and get what suits him best. There is no one-size-fits-all, no one standard that's applied to everybody. You can each have all the things that you want because you can deal with different people. 
Well, the fourth kind of regulation is the one we're most familiar with, the one we pay the most attention to, and that's political regulation, by which politicians impose their choices upon you and everyone else. Political regulation says, in effect, that you aren't competent to know what's best for you, nor are you competent to choose a source that can help you make decisions. <laughs> but strangely enough, the politicians are. They're not only competent to choose what's best for themselves, but they are so omniscient that they can choose what's best for you. And we've been taught since childhood that we need political regulation to force sellers to provide safe products. But the history of regulation provides example after example after example of the opposite. Here are just a few cases that come to mind. Consumer regulation asked for safer cars, and so automakers uh, developed uh, radial tires, safety glass, disc brakes, cruise control, turn signals, self seat belts, dozens of other features that make your car much, much safer than cars were 50 or 70 years ago. But political regulation has produced such things as mandatory airbags, which have killed dozens of little children. Consumer regulation asked for safer ways to smoke, prompting tobacco companies to develop filtered, uh, low-tar, and low-nicotine cigarettes. The companies competed with each other by advertising their tar and nicotine levels and by advertising other safety features. But then political regulation prohibited such advertising, so the tobacco companies no longer had an incentive to provide safer cigarettes. Now here's another one. Consumer regulation encouraged pharmaceutical companies to develop beta blockers that reduce the chance of a heart attack by keeping blood flowing to and from the heart. But political regulation kept those products off the American market for six long years, although in other countries they were readily available with no reported problems whatsoever. The delay caused at least 60,000 people to die prematurely from heart attacks. Scientist uh, Mary Ruart who was with the Upjohn Company at the time, says that more Americans may have been killed by being, uh, being denied access to this one drug than by the use of all unsafe drugs in the 20th century. One last example. Consumer regulation made banks and savings and loans safer because wealthy investors monitored the safety of those institutions. You didn't even have to know which ones were safe. The wealthy people did that by withholding their money from savings institutions that couldn't prove their safety. But then political regulation came along and raised the deposit insurance level from $10,000 up to $100,000 per account so that wealthy investors no longer had to monitor the safety of the institutions. They could now just spread their money uh, over a very few institutions and know that everything was going to be all right. This allowed the savings institutions to make riskier investments and brought on the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s. We can get an idea, I think, of how much better off you would be, how much your life could be improved if we got rid of all political regulation, just by looking at a few examples where it's actually been done. Let's take the banking industry, for instance. Before banking services were deregulated, practically every bank in the country, and I may not be amiss if I say that every bank in the country, kept the same hours, five days a week, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Five hours a bank was open each day. You may not be old enough to remember that, but I'm sure we have plenty of listeners who do remember that five days a week, five hours a day, banks were open. Every bank provided exactly the same accounts and services, every bank within your state, and they paid the same interest rates. Uh, you, you had no competition on interest rates. You had no competition among types of accounts. Uh, you chose a bank only by its location or the choice of check designs that it offered or the size of the free toaster that it would give you or the length of time that you had to wait in order to get a safe deposit box, but not on the basis of safety, not on the basis of service or any of those things. But after banking services were deregulated, banks started competing with real choices. Now there are longer operating hours, including Saturday service, ATM machines, after hours, outdoor tellers, debit cards, banking with your computer, better interest rates on deposits, many more choices among checking and savings accounts and time deposits and money market accounts. And now some banks are selling mutual funds and life insurance and much, much more. Now, don't get me wrong, there still is political regulation, which is creating real problems for banks. One is that the government's deposit insurance promotes banking irresponsibility, that $100,000 coverage on every account. And secondly, the government still limits the ways in which a bank can invest its depositors' money. But banks are much, much better to deal with today than they were 40 years ago. Another example, long-distance telephone service was a monopoly enforced by the government. AT&T was the one long-distance provider in the country, not because it was so big, not because it was so powerful. Well, it was powerful politically because it was able to get the politicians to maintain the monopoly for it. But once that was deregulated, the average cost of a cross-country call, which had ranged from 20 cents to a dollar a minute or more, started going downward, and now today almost anybody can make a telephone call for less than 10 cents a minute, and in some cases as little as 5, 4, or 3 cents a minute. 
At one time, it was illegal for private companies to provide overnight uh, nationwide courier service. The Postal Service wouldn't guarantee delivery or any of the other features that FedEx and UPS provide today. The ability to deliver something across the country guaranteed by tomorrow morning has undoubtedly saved a few lives, as well as billions and billions of dollars and a lot of jobs, I'm sure. Uh, one last example, the computer industry. Why has the computer industry provided such better computers, such lower-cost computers, and so forth? It wasn't political regulation. None of this is regulated by the government. It was competition among profit-seeking companies, not regulation, that made computers easier to use, that cut computer prices by over 95% between 1981 and 1995. It was competition, not regulation, that made computers faster and more powerful. It was competition, not regulation, that made them more reliable. Is the computer market exceptional? Yes. Yes, it is. It is exceptional in that it is one of the least regulated markets in America. If other industries don't progress at the same fast clip, it's not because they're older and more settled, but because they're more heavily regulated. Now, my point is, imagine, suppose all kinds of food and medicine and other industries were deregulated, the way banks have been, the way courier services have been, the way the computer industry is, and the way the telephone service has. Imagine the price of all these things falling by 10, 20, 30 percent. We pay an enormous price for regulation. There have been studies done that have indicated that it is close to a trillion dollars a year is spent complying with political regulation. Whatever the cost, it adds at least 10% to the cost of everything we buy. And it means that in addition to the nearly half of our incomes that we pay in taxes of one kind or another to one government or another, we have to tack on another 10% that we pay in the form of complying with computer regulation. And one last point. I've mentioned before that there are seven principles about government and regulation falls on all of them. Because government is force, regulation prohibits you from making your own choices. Because government is politics, government can never be a good referee of the marketplace. The referee will always side with the team with the most political influence. And because government always wants to grow, asking the government to assure the safety of food and medicine has led to government banning pesticides that could have saved lives by making the foods you eat safer and less expensive. The government even regula regulates the size of your toilet. Because you don't control the government, the regulation you want to see will never be applied in the way that you imagine it. And you can figure out the rest for yourself. And we did get an email from Eric regarding regulation. He says in Milton Friedman's book, Capitalism and Freedom, he described how the medical profession did not need licensing. He felt that without licenses, large department stores like Sears would have medical offices, and you would have the Sears reputation to guarantee the doctor's abilities. They would do this by certification of doctors, not by license. And Eric adds that in Pennsylvania, he says, I used to go to a Sears optician for glasses. He could read the prescription off my current lenses and make new ones for me. But then when I got to California, I was surprised to find that the law there required that I get a new prescription. If you scratch your lenses, it's illegal to get them repaired without paying off a licensed doctor or optometrist. And finally, he says, also in Holland and Germany, there is no profession called optometrist, only in America. I was overjoyed to be able to prescribe my own lenses in Amsterdam. I felt free for once. Well, let's see what's going on out in the great American hinterland. Let's talk with Jeffrey in New Orleans. Good evening, Jeffrey. Hi. What I have to say is somewhat ambivalent. But there, are, well, there is one area where government force is necessary. That is in the area of weights, measures, and standards of measurement. The problem here is that with no government regulation, I have no means of knowing if the products I buy are being short-weighted or if the land measurements I'm dealing with are improperly set up or some kind of, um, of hanky-panky is going on in terms of the, of the hand put, being put on the vegetable and fruit scale to overcharge me for products I didn't buy. That's the very reason that our Constitution allows the government, the Congress to set standards of weights and measures and why we have a Bureau of Standards. But on the other hand, the time zones that we have in this country were brought about because the railroads could not work with local communities which sent different local times in different parts of the country and confused matters so much so that people were missing trains. So in 1882, the railroads forced a conference of time standards to be set up based on the Greenwich Mean Time System where zero meridian is Greenwich in England and where we have the four basic time zones we have. Of course, there are aberrations such as Michigan being mostly on Eastern Time when they should be on Central Time. But the basic time zone concept was forced by railroads in order to make sure that they could arrive on time to pick up and, and, and uh, deliver passengers and freight so that people would not be um, thrown off balance in terms of the um, arrival of shipments and passengers. Well, one of the big problems that we have about political regulation is because the very existence of it leads so many people to believe that without it, we would be completely helpless. But the fact is that we're not helpless. For example, thanks to political regulation, when you buy a house, you know that the title really belongs to the person you bought it from. And therefore, you cannot possibly lose money by buying a house from somebody who doesn't really own it. Oh, no, wait a minute. I forgot. Political regulation doesn't do that. 
consumer regulation does, industry regulation does. Title insurance is completely a private function. It's a way by which sellers are able to guarantee to buyers that the title really is secure and that they don't have to worry about any kickback coming later, that they don't really own the property that they just paid $100,000 for or whatever it may be. The same thing is true with weights and measures or anything else. When I go to the store and I say, I tell the butcher I want a half a pound of thinly sliced roast beef, I don't know if his scale is correct. All I know is that if he is charging me more than I'm willing to pay for the roast beef because of uh, how good it is or how bad it is, then I'm not going to do business with him anymore. So his incentive is not to comply with some government edict, but to make sure that I'm satisfied enough to come back. And all sorts of things, all sorts of standards develop without government regulation at all. For example, who is it that decided that file folders ought to accommodate sheets of paper that are 8.5 by 11? Who decided what letter size paper was? It wasn't the government. Who decided what legal size? paper was. It wasn't the government. These things just developed. Who decided on the VHS standard as opposed to the beta standard? Consumers did. These things evolve out of the marketplace, but when somebody decides what they're going to be in Washington, then if it's not the best possible decision, we are stuck with it forever. But when the wrong decisions are made in the marketplace, they fade out as the Edsel faded out, as the new Coke fades out. But we don't get that opportunity when we give government the opportunity to make these decisions for us. Am I making myself clear? No, you're not, and I'll tell you something why. <laughs> no, I'll tell you why. Because because that by not having an independently set standard of measurement of weights, um, lengths, widths, and heights, etc., it's possible for stores for stores to confuse you by cheating you by saying this this is a, a different measurement of a pound that occurs in our store as opposed to another store, and I have no means of knowing who is right and who is cheating me unless I have I have a, set, a, a standard set measurement, such as in the foot pound system where a pound is 16 ounces as opposed to the troy pound, which is 12 ounces. But because, and because of those standards of measurement, it's possible for me to be able to decide which products are being short-weighted and, and, and be able to, to consume the products that I need. But if that's a problem, any store can solve it just by having a little sign on the scales or any place else saying, we are using the X system, whatever that system is, and you know that that's it. And if they're not really using it, then they're being dishonest. And the fact that government has decreed these standards doesn't really stop the dishonesty. It just uh, gives you a false sense of security. The point is that these things happen uh, without us having... To, to decide that because people don't want to confuse you. When they confuse you, you don't buy. Any salesman learns in his basic 101 selling class that you don't start overwhelming the customer with a whole lot of facts and figures because then the customer gets confused and a confused prospect is not a buying prospect. And so any business has an incentive to make sure that things are simple, that they're secure, that you can understand them well enough that you can make a decision. Any salesman also learns that when a buyer says, I don't know, I want to think this over, most likely... He is saying that because he doesn't have enough knowledge at that particular point to make a decision. And the lack of knowledge may be that he doesn't understand some part of it. So the point is that it's always in the seller's interest to make it as simple to understand as possible. And th this is what our protection is, is the fact that these people want to sell us goods and services, and they can't do it until we have been satisfied that it is safe, that it is a, a, a reasonable price, that you can't get it for less from somebody else, that you uh, have some recourse if you decide that you don't want this. I mean, look. Look at QVC, the television shopping network. You buy something from QVC, you have 30 days to return it, and you don't have to explain why you're returning it. You don't have to say it's faulty. You don't have to say it isn't what I intended. You just have to pack the thing up and send it back, and they will give you your money back. Now, who forced them to do that? Nobody. But they did it in their own self-interest because they knew that this was one way to get you to go ahead and buy when you weren't sure because you knew you had this recourse available to you. This is what sellers do. They're continually looking for ways to overcome the natural reluctance of people to part with their liquid money money for something that they may be sorry that they bought later. So well, I would have to say this in conclusion, that, that, that what I see here is, is a problem of, um, of a, a means of knowing um, in terms of the weight and measures problem, uh, how much I'm doing, how much I'm getting, and so on. And that the only reason that I can handle the weights and measures right now is because I was taught in the seventh grade the differences or conversions between metrics and, and the foot-pound system. But a lot of people don't know that. And as a result, it's, it, it, it can get very confusing when, for example, bacon is now being sold at 10 ounces packages, and, and I have to I have to know know these different size packages and then figure it to the pound, and, and so on. And so a lot of people are getting hurt because of the short weighting and a, and a bunch of other... But, uh, what, but one thing that's being overlooked, Jeffrey, is that these all these weights, the, the pound system, the inches to a foot, all of these things existed long before there was a United States government. Yeah, the United okay. States government did not decree these things. The government just simply picked up on what the marketplace had already decided. And in fact, in Canada, when I looked lived there in the early 70s, the government tried to impose upon the people the metric system. And I want to tell you 
that you had about 15 million very, very angry people there because they couldn't understand what was going on, and the opportunities to cheat somebody were legion simply because they were being forced to deal in a system that they didn't understand and which did not evolve from popular will as all the things that we tend to enjoy do. Even in the 19th century, Banks did not, banks issued their own dollars. They did not have to issue the same dollar that the United States government had decreed that was one twentieth of an ounce of gold. They could issue any kind of dollar they wanted. But they all issued the same dollar because that was what people expected them to issue. And some bank that didn't would soon be well known as a bank that you don't want to deal with because you don't really know what you're getting. And so, as these banks issued their own currencies before we had a national banking system, they automatically fell in line with what the popular will was because they couldn't compete if they didn't do that. Jeffrey, I always appreciate your comments. I'm glad you called tonight. Thank you so much. And let's go now to Tennessee and talk with Eugene. Good evening. How are you doing? Just fine. What's on your mind tonight? Well, you seem to be making the same old, ages old argument uh, uh, that the government that governs best is the one that governs least. And, you know... I, 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 I'd love to hear a debate between you and uh, Ralph Nader sometime. I would, too. I'd love that. Cause I, I, tr I tried to make that happen in the year 2000 when we were both running for president. And, Pat, and as a matter of fact, Pat Buchanan agreed to debate a three-way debate among us, but Ralph Nader would have none of it, unfortunately. Well, I, I think he could handle himself. Uh... Oh, I'm sure he could, but he thought that he was the leader among the three of us. He had the highest position in the polls, so he didn't want to debate downward, which I think was a mistake because he would have reached a lot of people that he wasn't reaching otherwise. Well, he, he's got to learn, you know. So the, the thing I was just... Wondering about it is that I, I hear you making these arguments all the time, and, and I keep thinking about cable TV and the dot com crash and uh, the uh, utility uh, scandal out in California and uh, these privatized prisons, airport security. All of this is is proof positive that, given the opportunity to uh, regulate themselves, these these businesses become abusive, and and that's this is a matter of public record. I don't. I mean, I'm not speculating or, or about anything. Okay, well, let's take a good example that's available from the public record, and we'll probably get cut off here because we're going to have to go to the break in a minute, so please bear with me and stay with me after the break. But in California, they've had a real problem with overcrowded prisons, and they find that two-thirds of the new inmates coming into prisons at any given time are parole violators. They're people who have violated their parole and going back into prison as a result of a parole violation. It turns out that almost all of these parole violations are for things like like not showing up for an appointment once or not informing the parole officer of something you were supposed to keep him informed of, and so on. Now, why is it that the prisons are overcrowded with something like that? has to do with regulation. We'll cover it when we come back. This is Harry Brown. There are examples of real problems that exist that need government regulation, and he cited the private prisons, the electrical system, and problems that existed in California. And I forget what the others were, but each one of them could be a subject for an extended conversation because one of the great advantages of government is that it can always find a way to blame private enterprise for whatever government does wrong, and it can always find a way to take credit for whatever private enterprise does that's good. But I took the prisons as the example and pointed out that in California, over two-thirds of the people entering prisons are going in for parole violations, and it's created a tremendous overcrowding problem, which has meant that murderers and rapists and other violent criminals are getting off with very light sentences or plea bar or all kinds of things because of the tremendous overcrowding there. Now, why is it that these people are all coming back in for parole violations? It's not because they've committed violence against somebody. If they had, then they would be tried for those crimes, and they would be going into prison for those crimes, not for parole violations. They're going in because they failed to show up for an appointment or because they failed to inform the parole officer of some change of address or change of job or some, some minor technical violation. Well, why in the world is the law structured so that somebody goes back into prison for that reason? Well, the answer is because it's politically regulated, and the strong two of the strongest political entities in California are the Parole Officers Union and the various police associations throughout the state, and they are the ones that are getting these mandatory sentences and other things imposed that are creating such prison problems. Now, I don't know what kind of private prison problems you're talking about, but they can't be any worse than what we're seeing with people being locked up for technical violations while violent people are getting out on the streets. So what's the private well, prison well, problem? I, I just cited all of those uh, examples for one reason. I, I guess you're, you're misunderstanding what I'm saying here. Uh, I guess one of the key points I wanted to make to you is that uh, your problem with the government doesn't appear to be the, the private sector's problem because they're the biggest special interest group lobbying on Capitol Hill and have been, I guess, since the beginning of this, this nation. Who are you talking about? The private sector. You keep saying that, that uh, these people can handle their own business, and yet they're more than comfortable with their marriage with this government that you're well, of course, so Of course. Why not? If the government is going to offer you favors, then you're going to take them, and that's the problem. The problem is in Washington. If the favors weren't there, you wouldn't have lobbyists but you, there. But you can't make up your mind. You don't, one, one minute you're, you're, you're propping up the, the private sector, the business sector, the next minute you're trying to cut your throat. And then, uh, no, 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 wait a second. And then you no. want to go after the, the government, and we're, hey, this is a representative democracy we live in, so you're not just attacking them, you're attacking me and the very heart of the Constitution of the United States. 
I see. You set up this political regulation that I'm attacking? Political re- regulation? It, we... We have a representative democracy. Who are these people in Congress, whether it's on the local, state, or federal level, who, who do they represent? They represent us. We elect them. We, we, <laughs> they don't represent me, I can tell you. Uh, well, but wait, wait a second. We've we got to get back to your earlier point where you said that I'm running both sides of the fence here. No, I'm not talking about the individual businesses. I'm talking about the system. If you don't have favors dispensed in Washington, if you don't have politicians saying, hey, I'll protect you from your competitors, hey, I'll put in a minimum price here so people have to pay what you want, even though it's possible to produce this product or less, if you didn't have politicians offering this, then every private business would be trying to succeed on its own voluntary efforts. Those that used violence to succeed would go to jail for using violence. But we would not have people running to Washington trying to get favors. The problem is not the lobbyists. The problem is that there is our favors to be bought and sold in Washington. So if we stuck to the Constitution, which does not authorize political regulation, incidentally, there's nothing in the Constitution that authorizes a Federal Trade Commission, a Federal Communications Commission, a Securities and Exchange Commission, or any of these other federal agencies. None of them are authorized in the Constitution, and if we stuck to the Constitution, then every business in the country would have to compete on its merits rather than its political pull. You mean like slavery was? <laughs> See, that's the thing that gets me. Uh, slavery was uh, amended out of the Constitution. Yeah. If you if you want to continue this, stay on. We'll, I'll give you another couple of minutes when we come back from the break, but now we got to go to the news. Stay with us. This is Harry Brown. We have another hour to go. We do have people waiting on the phone, so I'm not going to extend this conversation too long with Eugene in Tennessee, but Eugene has raised some points that you very often hear about government regulation and why we have to have government. And, Eugene, you raised the point at the very outset. You said you must be one of these people that believes that that government governs best that governs least. And, yes, I am. And with David Thoreau, I believe that that government government would probably govern best of all that govern not at all. And why do I think that? It is because government is force. And government being force means that we are going to have whoever has the most political influence get their way and force it upon others, whereas no private company can force you to deal with it. So naturally, I want to reduce government to the absolute minimum possible, and if someday we find a way to get along without any organized force, any legalized force whatsoever, I'll be all for it. I don't know exactly how it will work, but I know that this system is not working very well at all, and that's why I do believe that that government that governs least governs best. I mentioned slavery and private prisons for a reason. See, the privatized prisons are using the uh, inmates for basically slave labor, and rather than deal with the the, the general public out here, because they know that uh, a working public will make demands and what can an inmate demand and on top of that uh, no private company should be uh, managing a prison uh, full of inmates who were prosecuted by the state well that's a that's an interesting point that you've raised number one they are doing the same thing that government prisons do and that is to put people to work in there and pay them a slave labor wage or no wage at all and secondly private prisons are regulated by the government obviously the government doesn't send inmates to prisons unless the government approves of that particular prison that it's sending the inmate to so whatever complaint you have should be registered with the government you're confusing no no they're uh, lobbying they're, these people lobby the government of course they are because the government is there to do favors for them and that's what i keep saying that as long as you have a government that will protect you from your competitors that will give you a monopoly that will force people to deal with you who don't want to deal with you whether it is through a medical association a, a bar association or whatever it may be then as long as that exists, then you're going to have people taking advantage of it. But this whole relationship I've been talking about has existed from the beginning of this nation, uh, where it was the landowners and, and a lot of these slaveholders who were the ones that, that had the, the, the biggest advantages at the beginning of this nation. But the more people insisted that this didn't happen, the more regulations came in place to protect the public out here at large. And that's, why, and that's why all these tens of millions of people flocked from Europe to come to America, is so that they could be enslaved by the landowners? Uh, well, you just misunderstood what I said. You didn't hear what I said. No, anyway, you, you, I, I, made, I made my point, and, and like I, said, I try to listen to you whenever, you're, whenever, they, whenever they run you here on this radio station, but uh, you know, this, this conservative mindset just leaves me cold a lot. Oh, it's not a conservative mindset. I am not a conservative. A conservative wants to conserve big business and big government operating for the benefit of the fatherland, and that's not what I want at all. I want big business to have to work on its own to earn our respect and earn our business and not to be able to get it through government. But they and, only want to earn profit. They don't care anything about uh, doing anything for your benefit or my benefit, and if anybody... Well, Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How are they going to get those profits? How are they going to get those profits? Yeah, are you just going to hand them the money? Well, take a look at TV. You see those... those uh, um, Heavily regulated by the government. No, but look at, look at the commercials for uh, these drugs, prescription drugs. Uh-huh. You see how they're set up, and at the end they hit you with the punchline. Well, here are the, the Twilight Zone style uh, uh, effects that you could go through that you could face uh, if, you, if you take the stuff. And, and yet they build you up and make you believe that if you don't take it, 
look what's going to happen to you. You're not going to make it. So how many different of uh, these drugs do you take? I'm not taking any of them. But look really? At you mean you mean they have no effect upon you whatsoever? They have any effect on me because I'm the one making a decision whether or not I wanted to buy into these commercials. Is that right? You mean you actually think for yourself and make a decision? No. Well, but are you the only person in the country yeah, without ability? People, look at how many people who, who have been taken in by this. And they, they're running Wait a minute. Wait a minute. They're when running out there for the Viagra. They're running out there for it. Wait a minute. Maybe they need it. Maybe it's solving a problem for them and fulfilling a need. Do you think that people just simply say, oh, I didn't know that I needed to perform better sexually. Oh, I didn't know that I need to be worried about having a heart attack. Oh, I didn't know this. Well, thank you for telling me. You can't succeed in business. If you've ever been in business, you would know that you can't succeed unless you are appealing to a need that already exists. Now, you may be offering a product that never existed before, but you, but that product has to appeal to a need that exists already. That's the only possible way you can succeed because resources are limited. People have limited budgets. People can't just spend money on whatever comes along, whatever you advertise to them, whatever you offer them. They're not going to roll over and play dead for you if you think so, then why don't you go in business and make yourself a billion dollars, and then you can solve all the problems of the world without government. Because the market's been cornered out. It's been cornered by a handful of people, and, and uh, it's, it's already been done. How could I jump in now? You mean you wouldn't be able to advertise on television? They wouldn't let you on television with your product? Would, would the ad rates be on what they are? Well, why, why are the ad rates so high? Why are these companies paying such high ad rates? They must be succeeding. Ratings. I mean, the shows that, that the, uh, the, the stations or the channels and the networks or the corporations are running are generating ratings, and that means that these people have to pay their price. You're not pulling in the ratings. You're going to come up with some kind of barter deal or something just to get your uh, your, your ad or your commercial on, on the air, whether it's radio or television. Well, and because they are appealing to needs that people have, they succeed, and the ones that don't appeal to needs don't show up on television Well, they're anymore. appealing to the lowest common denominator, and, and fear is often what drives it. You, you know, wrinkles, uh, uh, sex, whatever it is. That, that you, are you telling me that it is irrational somehow for somebody to be concerned about growing old and getting wrinkles on the face, that to do something about that is a sign of irrationality? Irrationality? Fear is irrational? Fear is, is, a, is a legitimate emotion. Of course it is. But it's and... exploited by people who are trying to sell you something you don't need. <laughs> well, people with heart conditions are exploited by people selling you medicine well, that will lower your blood pressure. Heart condition? How do you know this? Somebody uh, plays a doctor on TV, that doesn't mean that they are. I presume that you are going to go to a doctor and find out what your condition is if you think that you may have a heart condition, that you will go to a doctor and find out. And you don't know how healthy you are, so you're going to be dealing with side effects that, that could just make you much worse off than you are. So all I'm saying is, is that you know you, you can't have it both ways. Either you, you're, you believe in the Constitution, you believe in this nation, or you, you believe in the, the private sector. You can't make up your mind, it seems to me. I don't follow you on that. I was just about to terminate this conversation, but I don't well, follow okay. right. uh, I, I don't follow so the, the, what is the Constitution. What is the purpose of the Constitution? To regulate this nation, so we can govern ourselves. What else? To regulate the nation or to regulate the government? To govern ourselves, so we can have a system by which we, through which we govern ourselves. No, actually, the Constitution was written to prescribe exactly what the government was allowed to do and what it was not allowed to do. Governing, that, that's government, that's what it's all about. And the very fact that it limited the government to so few functions meant that there was a private system. So for me, to advocate a private system and to advocate a Constitution is not a contradiction. All I'm saying is that if we stuck to the Constitution, then the regulation would take place in the private sector, and we would get the government out of these $2 trillion worth of enterprises that we see no benefit from whatsoever and we could probably live much, much healthier and much more prosperous lives. Slavery and child labor would still exist in this country. If that no, you don't understand that at all. Child labor died out in this country around the turn of the 20th century. And the of first, government regulation? No, the first, the first federal child labor law wasn't passed until 1938. If child labor existed in the 19th century because it was necessary for families to have everybody in the family working in order to be able to support a family. Farms were that way, and then the children and the parents both started migrating to the cities because they had much better lives in the cities working 10- or 12-hour days than they did work working 14-hour days on the farm. They could, live, they could live better and so forth. But as industry progressed, as technology progressed, it became possible for people to work shorter days, and eventually it became possible for one person to support an entire family. And when that happened, female labor died out, child labor died out, and 30 years after that, the government climbed on the bandwagon and passed the child labor law, which does nothing but create problems for children who do want to work and who would like to work at McDonald's or someplace else. Government regulation is not the answer. Thank you for your call, Eugene. I appreciate your point of view. I don't agree with it at all. We have just a minute before we go to this break, so I'm not going to take another call. But we come back again to the question of if you have a problem, whom do you want to solve it? Do you want Teddy Kennedy to take care of it, or do you want your doctor to take care of it? Do you want somebody who's trying to please you in order to make a profit to take care of it, or do you want George Bush to take care of it? Obviously, if it's George Bush or Teddy Kennedy or Bill Clinton or Trent Lott or somebody like that, then what you're going to get is a service available to the highest bidder. Whoever has the most political influence is going to decide what the regulation is going to be, what the standard is going to be. But if you have the freedom to choose whatever you want, then there are going to be 10, 20, 30 choices available to you, and you get exactly what you want. We'll be right back. This is Harry Brown. Hello again. Harry Brown here. 
Michael sent me an email about the last call, said he was afraid that the caller was going to blame slavery on the private sector. And one important point to make is that government helped to keep slavery going. And, of course, slavery was legalized and enforced by the southern state governments, which are governments. But Michael points out, by the 19th century, free labor was both cheaper and more productive than slave labor, and one of the big expenses in keeping slaves was dealing with runaways. Buying a new slave or recovering the old one were both very, very costly. Thanks to the Fugitive Slave Act, passed in large part by northern congressmen who saw the act as a way to prevent blacks from entering their home states and their labor markets, the cost of getting runaways back was absorbed by taxes rather than the individuals who were attempting to recover what the law It wasn't private law, it was government law, unfortunately deemed to be property, which is a very good point. Slavery has a hard time existing in the absence of government to enforce it, obviously. Let's go now to Missouri and talk with Albert. Good evening, Albert. I don't think we've heard from you before, have we? Uh, No, you haven't, Harry, and uh, thank you very much for taking my call. I'm glad to get on with you here. It's my pleasure. Uh, Are you the Harry Brown that wrote the book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World? That is I. I read your book. I really enjoyed that. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And I totally agree with you. The government that governs least is the government that governs best. And one of your previous callers said that we were a representative democracy. I thought we were a constitutional republic. Were we not founded as a republic? Well, yes, and the difference is that a republic, of course, has a limit on what the government can do. A democracy, a pure democracy would mean the government can do anything. It can outlaw free speech. It could do anything that you could get a majority of people to go along with. And we had a, a long discussion either last week or the week before with someone who called in who said that if you don't like the law, then what you need to do is to change it, as though you could do something about the millions of laws that exist in this country that have been passed because of the concept that whatever the majority or their representatives in City Hall or Washington, D.C. deem best can be passed in the law and there are no limits on government whatsoever it is a runaway government that we have there isn't anything there isn't a single subject there isn't a single issue that congress would not take up and seriously consider passing a law about there is nothing that they consider to be off limits pardon me for running away with that albert yeah, that is true harry uh, we've reached a point in this country we're so overregulated uh that uh, we're stifling our country our investments our private enterprise we're stifling everything with all the regulations and like uh franz pick once said when he was standing at a latrine uh, with a bunch of people, they were all standing at this public latrine, and he said, it's a good thing the government doesn't come in here because if they saw something running freely, they'd want to regulate it. (laughs) Oh, God, that's awful. (laughs) Isn't that? And that's what he said. You know, I read it in one of his, uh, I don't know, articles or books. Uh Well, I knew Franz Pick, and I do not put that past him at all. (laughs) Yeah, oh, you knew him, huh? Yes. Okay. Anyway, I am interested also in your fail-safe investments, but I don't have a computer to download it. How can I get this otherwise, or can I? The best thing to do would be to go to Amazon and try to obtain a used copy. Uh, Amazon still has a page for fail-safe investing, and they will usually say used copies available for so much, you know, from from oh, so okay. much up. And usually the copies that you get are very, very good. They they have a network of used book dealers, and they tell you what the condition of the books are, and you probably have four or five different choices, okay. ranging from fair to very, very good, like new or whatever. And that's that's my best suggestion that I can do. Okay, that, good, that will work, man. Good, good to hear from you, Albert. I hope yeah, you continue I want to, to listen. One more comment here. All right. Having traveled, I've traveled around the world a lot, and I can almost go anywhere in the world today and try and find more freedom than I can in the United States. Well, that can be deceptive because sometimes you are overawed, as I have been when I've traveled abroad, by certain freedoms that exist there that don't exist here, and we overlook the ones that we take for granted here but that are not available in the countries that we visit because we're not residents and so we don't run into some of the restrictions. Uh, We don't really have any country in the world that you can look at and say is really a free country that is as free as, say, America was 100 years ago, not even Switzerland. But I understand what you're saying. It can be surprising how some of the things that have become so restrictive here are almost totally unregulated in some other countries of the world. And I know a lot of people who are very enthusiastic about New Zealand these days uh, for, I think, the lack of business regulation there, and yet, at the same time, there are a lot of things you wouldn't like about living in New Zealand. Yes, I've been there. It's in a socialist country. Mm-hmm. And they, I want The answer always is to try to find the country that has the freedoms that mean the most to you and where the restrictions are ones that don't really touch you very much personally. Oh, that music means we've got to take a break, Albert. Thanks so much for calling. Stay with us. Keep listening to the broadcast, and let's hear from you from time to time. This is Harry Brown. We'll be right back after these words. My apologies to people who've been kept waiting on the telephone. We'll get to as many calls as we can in this last half hour. I do like to, wherever possible, get callers that we haven't heard from before, especially if they do want to disagree with what I have to say because they raise important points, points that you hear quite frequently from friends, neighbors, business associates, and we want to deal with those points wherever we can rather than ignore them. Let's go to South Dakota and talk with Dan. Good evening, Dan. Oh, hi, you in San Diego? 
Oh, San Diego, SD. Well, all right. Dan in San Diego. How are you doing, Harry? My favorite rock musician, and that's because you're the only rock music musician I know. <laughs> all right, since you did that, obviously, www.peacemakersrock.com. Okay, we peacemakers, got that in. Because real peace, peacemakers don't rule, peacemakers rock. Oh, uh, good. Okay, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, I'm calling about Eugene, the caller you had at the end of the last hour and beginning of this hour. You know, most people know in their hearts that the country is off track. Eugene calls this show here because he's afraid of where it's going. Okay, some of us say everything is over-regulated, but to people like Eugene, it's because of deregulation, and he had a list of industries that are supposedly deregulated, all of which are heavily regulated. Yes, I didn't make a note of them at the time, and I wish that I had, because later when I referred back to them, I could only remember the two examples, prisons and California electricity. Do you remember what the others were? Well, my favorite, I remember my favorite. My favorite was airline security. Now, leading up to 9-11, there were government rules in place that you couldn't have any armed security on a plane. Everyone's sitting ducks on these planes, while even liquor stores have armed security, and they're able to take over an airplane with box cutters, and he blames the private market. But <laughs> this is the rule. The rule was you will be sitting ducks. Yes. The government has a whole line of rules that are sitting ducks laws that disarm people in various situations. But this is ridiculous. If, if it hadn't been specified, somebody would have said, I'm not going on a plane unless you've got armed security. Somebody would have said, well, we have this kind of armed security, and somebody else would have said, well, we have that kind of armed security. And, and somebody else would have said, we don't have any at all, and, and we're $25 less than the others. Yeah. And, and you would choose for yourself how much security you wanted to buy. Exactly. And, and the problem is that if you told this to Eugene, he would have, when you said every company would have to compete on its merits, he said, you mean like slavery? Okay, in, in, in 1984 by George Orwell, one of the party slogans was, freedom is slavery. And so Eugene was afraid that if you were free to watch ads on TV for Viagra, you'd be enslaved by these ads. But you'd buy Viagra and heart medication, even if you didn't need it. Of course, he knew the difference. <laughs> sure. Freedom to slavery. He called you to explain that tonight, and I just I tell you, I... It, <laughs> yeah, one of, the, one of the, the interesting things about human nature is that each of us acts and believes as though he has free will, but that everyone else is devoid of free will. Yeah, that, I don't do that. That everyone else can be manipulated. Everyone else can be affected by advertising. Everyone else can be uh, made to do the right thing if you push the right buttons and so forth, but that doesn't apply to me because I've got free will. Well, either I have it and everybody else does, or nobody else has it, and I don't have it either. But if you've got it, then you must assume that everybody else does too, and that they can make up their little minds whether or not to buy Viagra or wrinkle cream or whatever it is that somebody's peddling on television. My God, if you stop and think of the hundreds of ads you see every week, if you even watch television just an hour or two a day, all these ads you see, and you buy about one product for every 500 ads that you might see. It doesn't seem to me that those advertisers have very much influence over you, but unless they're appealing to something that has already concerned you. Are you trying to say that freedom is not slavery? <laughs> you, you know, he would, I know that's a contradiction in terms. Eugene was also confused because uh, he, he doesn't see, see you, you sound to him immediately like you're a business promoter, but you're not. You're just a promoter of people's free choice. Yes. In that environment, businesses do very well, uh, but see, he can't handle the fact that you're not extreme left or extreme right. He didn't know how to classify you, and it was very confusing for him, I think. Yes, I'm not with the Chamber of Commerce. Dan, I always appreciate your comments. You have very good insights into things. Do stay in touch with us. Thanks. Let's Let's talk now with John in Arizona. Good evening, John. Hi. Um, I just want to let you know that in about four weeks, Arizona gets treated to the national Democratic presidential primary. And uh, the only two people that seem to be getting any traction are Wesley Clark and Howard Dean. And uh, so your your primary is just after the New Hampshire one, is yeah, that it? It's uh, about four weeks from now. I, I, I see. Uh, Wesley Clark is running as an anti-war candidate. Mm, sort of. This has been his profession his whole life. Yes. <laughs> and he says in his ad he won't use uh, violence except as a last resort. And, uh, He'll just drop bombs from airplanes. <laughs> well, it, I saw the ad where he said he liberated a whole people without the loss of a single American life. I think out the other people, they don't, they, they're worthless, I guess. Yeah, that's right. He, he's the, very enthusiastic about killing Serbians. But um, Anyway, he, this business about last resort, I think that's exactly what George Bush said about Iraq. This is the last resort. We oh, have yeah. to resort. So I don't, who's he fooling? Uh, I don't, not fooling me. Uh, and the enthusiasm level here uh, seems to be almost non-existent, uh, Clark will show up, or Dean will show up, and maybe 50 or 100 people might uh, come to the rally. And these are the people with the most high profile and the most money, and nobody seems to be uh, really interested. Mm -hmm. So hopefully the turnout will be very low, uh, because uh, we had a mayoral election in November, which is really off here, and the uh, turnout for a mayor and city council uh, was 37%, and that was the lowest in I don't know how many years, uh, several decades anyway. Yeah, well, you, uh, two interesting things. Number one is that if the turnout is low in the primary and Clark and Dean are the principal contenders, then this will be interpreted by the media that the anti-war message is, doesn't have much traction, that people wouldn't come out for these anti-war candidates or what they perceive to be anti-war co candidates. And I like your statement about the last resort. To a politician, 
War is always the first resort, but they always talk as though it was the very last resort. We wouldn't have done this if there had been any way to avoid it, and yet they're on a fast track to war from the very, very, very beginning. And in the research that I've been doing for the book The War Racket, which ought to be out before the 22nd century or sometime, I'm just struck by over and over and over again how long before the incident that started the war, how long before that the American president was gearing up for war and getting well, ready for it. And, of course, American presidents are no different from British prime ministers or French prime ministers. Well, the way things are going, you're going to be writing that book forever because every every week there's some new uh, wrinkle uh, about what happened, you know, like you said, some time before or this was linked to something else. And, and uh, uh, I just I did finish reading James Bovard's book. Uh, On terrorism. Terrorism tyranny. And near the end, George Bush was quoted as saying, you can fool some of the people all the time, and those are the ones you need to concentrate on. <laughs> yes, right. So uh, uh, <laughs> that, well, that is a, that, that is a, sounds a lot smarter than George Bush actually appears sometimes. Right. Well, Karl Rove must have thought that up for him. But I do want to call attention to Bovard's book, Terrorism and Tyranny. Well, it, it, he, it'll scare the pants off of anybody who's like uh, uh, oblivious to this or who actually supports these things uh, because of some sense of patriotism. Or who believes that it all started on September 11th. Or who believes this is all really necessary. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleasantly surprised that the courts decided to uh, allow, allow, although it's constitutionally uh, permitted, Jose Batia to have a lawyer finally. Yes. Uh, and although he wasn't charged with anything except uh, a thought crime, possibly, uh, they had no evidence. They still have no evidence he was actually doing anything, as far as I'm aware. He was just a suspect. Well, you're, if you're a suspect, you're, you're entitled to a due process. And he, so this is really frightening that this can happen, and, and, and Bush is opposed to the court's decision. Well, that shows you where his mind is at. Well, John, I don't think you understand. George Bush made it very, very clear that Jose Padilla is one of the bad guys. Uh, George Bush has decided who's guilty and who's innocent. Well, and, and if George Bush knows why do we need to have lawyers, why do we need to have courts, why do we need to have trials, all we need to do is to just check with George Bush and see who's guilty and who's innocent. Well, when George Bush is out of office, it's going to be somebody else who's going to make that sure. decision. Sure. And, th- and all those conservatives, if Howard Dean somehow becomes president next year, uh, all those conservatives who just thought George Bush needed all of these powers to invade our civil liberties and needed all of the, this money to be able to nation-build around the world are going to have apoplexy when it's Howard Dean that's administering all these programs. And suddenly it's going to be uh, the terrible fear of big government. We've got to do something about it. The wonderful thing about Al Gore being elected, if he had been elected, would have been that we would have had an enormous army of conservatives fighting the very things that George Bush is doing now, because Al Gore probably would have done much the same thing. But there would have been a huge army of influential people fighting against him instead of bowing down and saying whatever George Bush wants must be right. Well, John, go ahead. Thanks for your uh, show. And uh, for that uh, caller earlier, Eugene, um, he needs to go and read some basics about from Louis von Mises or Frederick Hayek or Henry Hazlitt. I mean, he just... John, I, don't, I, I understand just, what he's saying, but he, he needs to get to the basics. John, don't hold your breath. <laughs> well, okay. I'm just, if he's still listening, uh, hold, you, know, you can always cross your fingers. You know, what can I right. Do? I think one thing that's important, you don't have to hang on to somebody as long as I did in that conversation with Eugene. There are some people who just look at the world in a completely different way. And if so, that's fine. That's their business. That's their uh, opportunity to do. And But it becomes my problem if I feel that I must convert him. And there are enough people in this world who are receptive to the message of freedom and liberty and libertarianism that we don't need to spend a lot of time talking to people who just simply have a completely different worldview. I do it on this show because they're well, raising points that other people without that strong least, worldview might uh, raise. At least he's listening and he doesn't turn it off. I mean, that's Yes, of course. And he's obviously an intelligent person, so I, I have no complaint. John, thanks so much for calling. Let's go to Clymer, New York and talk with Roger. Good evening, Roger. Sorry to keep you waiting so long. Oh, that's okay. You'll hear from my lawyers in the morning. <laughs> All right. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, there was something that you didn't mention about government regulation. That, what was that? Well, how it fosters a mind sink, per se. I mean, um, the way to treat cancer is with chemo and radiation. Why? Because the doctors and the government said that is the way to treat you know, cancer. Uh, so, in other words, there's been really no advances in cancer treatment because we're still treating people with chemo and radiation. Because why? The government says that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, much as the way of airbags, it becomes the government sits there and says, well, we figure an airbag is the way to make a car safer. So the industry says, well, okay, we go along with it. And no, and it's, it's one size fits all, and if it's the wrong size, tough. Yeah, that's right, because like, like for me, I personally don't believe that chemo and radiation. I understand. Roger, we we got to go to a break. Hang on. This is Harry Brown. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Hello again, Harry Brown here. This is our final segment, and I want to thank you for tuning in tonight. And I... Hope that you haven't objected to the fact that so much of tonight's show has dealt with regulation. 
but let's just call this a theme broadcast. We're talking with Roger in Clymer, New York, and Roger, you were talking about the fact that the U.S. government has monopolized cancer research and imposed one type of research and one type of progress on the cancer-fighting community, and we have seen little or no progress in cancer solutions over these many, 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 many years that the government's been involved in it. Well, you could say that about most anything the government does get itself involved in. Um, there's another flip side to this. Um, let's just say someone wants to open a business and make X product or Y product or Z product, you know, whatever. Well, by the time he commits and follows all these government rules, regulations, and whatever, there is no way that he can make that product as cheap as if it was made in Mexico where they don't have near of all those, quote, <laughs> internal tariffs. Sure. Or in China, and essentially it then limits the economy in that way because you know, there's no way he can compete with someone making the same thing outside the United States and right. bringing, the thing, bringing that product in. And then the private companies are blamed for being greedy and going offshore and wanting to exploit cheap labor overseas and so forth, and nobody asks, well, why didn't they do that 30 years ago? Why, since there's always been cheaper labor overseas, why have companies operated within the United States when they could have operated more cheaply overseas until just the last 10 or 20 years when there suddenly was a big migration? And, of course, the answer is because it finally became just too blasted expensive to operate in the United States, thanks to government regulation. Uh, correct. Well, anyway, that's it. I see if you can get a couple more phone calls. Okay. Tonight and thanks very much, thank Roger. You. And I did get an email from Eric who reminded me that one of the other failures of the free market that Eugene mentioned was the dot-com companies that failed a few years ago. And Eric says, these were companies created out of new Federal Reserve money, then sunk when the, the money spigot was shut off. And that doesn't sound like a failure of private enterprise, but rather of money and stock market regulation. Well, that's a very good point. I would also look at it another way. I would say that it was a triumph of the free market. Because, uh, first of all, we have to understand that no one invested in a dot-com company who didn't do it voluntarily. Contrast that with having to put your money into space shuttles that blow up, and you suddenly realize that it's a really quite a benefit not to have to invest in anything you don't want. And anything that the government does, whether it's cancer research, space exploration, or whatever, you have to invest in whether or not you think that this is a good investment. Secondly, not all the dot-com companies failed. Most of them didn't fail. There were one or two failures, but mostly what happened was that companies' securities became overpriced. The companies didn't go out of business. Their stock prices just fell. That's all because the market got carried away because, as Eric pointed out, there was an excess of new money flooding the market, new money printed and distributed by the Federal Reserve System, a government agency in Washington, D.C., and the fact that the market was able to readjust the prices of these companies to more realistic levels without having to hit anybody over the head or stick a gun in anybody's back, without having to threaten anyone with fines or imprisonment, is a testament to the efficiency of the free market. So I don't see the dot-com situation as being any kind of a failure of the free market or failure of anything whatsoever. It worked like it was supposed to. And, of course, part of the manifestation of the dot-com revolution was the computer revolution that I spoke of earlier where prices have plummeted and efficiency has has skyrocketed. Thank you for being with me. Tune in next week. This is Harry Brown.